Having just watched this R34 GTR run in 8.2 at 177 mile an hour in what is essentially complete stock trim, I had to find out a little bit more about what makes this so far. So we're here with Av from B2R Motorsport to get into the nitty gritty of the tech detail. So Av, for a start, uh, the engine combination in this. Uh, we're at GTR Festival and I've seen all manner of GTR, RB26, RB28, RB30 combinations. What is the specifics of this engine? So this is a bullet billet block um, running a 3.4 litre. So it's a custom crankshaft, um, 90 by 90 stroke and bore obviously, that's what we spoke about before. Um, it runs a Pro Mod 88. Pro Mod 88. Gen 2. Um, fairly standard head. Let's start with that block because sure. this is a block we actually covered with Bullet back a couple of years ago at World Time yep. Attack when it was yep. brand new. So it's quite a unique block because it actually sort of borrows a little bit from the Supra's 2JZ, yeah, doesn't yeah. it? So it uses a 2JZ main journal, like, well, the main tunnel, I guess. But um, it uses the 2JZ bearings and everything like that, which I think helps with, you know, the longevity of everything being a wider journal than what the standard RB26 is. Um, and so that, is that, is that, is that a, a, a common failure point with the RB26 crankshaft or block, the uh, the size of that journal? Correct, yeah. So with big horsepower stuff, up to about a thousand horsepower, they're pretty reliable, but when you start going anything over a thousand horsepower and big revs, they seem to fail, which, yeah, is a con quite common issue if you're going, you know, big horsepower and big torque. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the rest of the rotating assembly, you mentioned a custom crankshaft there to suit that block from yeah. Kelly's. Uh, what about the, the rod and piston combination in there? Um, so the rods, the rods are supplied by Kelly's as well. It's a Carrillo rod um, and the piston is a CP piston that we use in that. Uh, what about compression ratio there? The compression is 9.5 to 1. Okay, so yep. relatively low setup for pump gas and E85, Correct. not purely yeah. methanol? Correct. So we run this car in E85. He still uses pump 85 um, and yeah we've had it up to about 55 to 60 pound of boost. The only thing that's limiting us is just the fuel system at the moment where we use six injector um, but yeah that we'll be sorting that in the near future as well. Well we'll come back and talk about the fuel system and that limitation shortly. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned a stock cylinder head which is somewhat surprising given the amount of power this is making. Most people would probably assume that it's ported to within a millimetre of its life and yeah. running uh, every other component that you could cram into an RB26 head. Uh, I guess the question is why isn't it? Okay so we used to, well, we're not, I can't say we used to but we've tried ported cylinder heads before but with the street cars and running that much power and stuff you on ethanol as well when you're getting up there in the boost they seem to fail after a little while so a few years back we went to just keeping them standard ports um, doing obviously a custom cam and you know a bigger a bigger valve and a spring to suit um, and yeah they've been reliable we haven't had any issues since and the heads just get used over and over again so uh I, I'm safe to assume here one of the, the known failure points with the stock RB26 head is the, the valve guides tend to crack and you know when they crack and fall to pieces yep. doesn't end well you're generally going to lose at least the turbo if not your entire engine so safe to say that you're running some aftermarket parts inside this head. Correct yeah it uses a bronze uh, Ferrero guide so that, that's what's going to help with that, that side of things I guess yeah. The other limitation with the RB26 head is you, you're very limited in stock form to the, the size of cam lobe you can run because of interference between the cam lobe and the cylinder head Correct. so again so safe to assume that it's been clearance to suit a, a fairly aggressive cam profile. That's right yeah it's been clearance to suit. In, so terms of, in terms of the rest of the engine package, I've noticed it is dry sump. Is that yep. uh, sort of a, an essential element for drag racing or with a billet block uh, obviously the, the G-forces are more intense for circuit racing where we typically see dry sumps being a, a sort of a common go-to. Correct, yeah. We, I found with the dry sump as well, it's helped with longevity of the engine as well. Look, wet sump is good and they have, they have come a long, long way with the uh, wet sump oil pumps, but uh, you, you can't beat dry sump setup, yeah, for high RPM. I guess that's where it helps us. In terms of that RPM range, what, what are you revving this engine to? And let's talk about some of those numbers around it. On average it revs to about nine, nine and a half, but we can go up to 10, 10 plus if we need to. Yeah. And you mentioned around about 55, 60 PSI boost if, if I remember correctly? Correct, yeah. So the car right now is running at about 55 pound, up to 55 pound. Um, the only thing that's limiting us is what we spoke about before is the injectors. But yeah, it can run 60, 65 plus, 60, 60 plus PSI boost if needed. 
Okay, and on the current limitation, the power level? On the current, uh, with the current setup right now, it roughly sits at about 1650 horsepower at the rear hubs. And if you didn't have that fuel system limitation and you were able to wind the boost up, where would you expect this to sort of, what, what power could it make? I think it'd land somewhere in the 1800s. It'd be about 18, 1850, that's where it'd sit. That's getting pretty serious yeah. for a street car. Yeah. Now the other element, we'll come back again to these limitations, but the other element with a, a billet block is there's a, a lot of controversy about how streetable a billet block is, particularly yep. in terms of the amount it grows yep. as it heats up. So yep. this is being street driven. Correct. Talk yep. to us about how what's required to, to make a billet block live in a street car. Well, nothing really, I guess. With, with this current car, all we really have is some safety set up. So when the customer obviously starts it in the morning, he lets it warm up for about five to 10 minutes until the oil temperature comes up and you notice the pressure drop and that's when the safeties, you know, come off and then he can take off, which roughly takes about five to 10 minutes on an average day. Um, besides that, like if I didn't tell you how to build a block, you wouldn't know, you'd be driving it as per normal. So it's not too wild and I mean with most performance engines for anyone with a little bit of mechanical sympathy it's unlikely that you're going to sort of start the thing, exit the garage and straight away hit 10,000 RPM, correct? Correct, yeah, correct, yeah. Alright, let's talk about the electronics package in the yeah. car, what's controlling it at the moment? So this has got a Link G4X plug and play, um, just your normal Link G4X that any other GDR would run. Um, so that's the limitation there because that G4X as a plug and play which does, as its name suggests, plug straight into the factory harness correct. only has six injector drives on board. So it only allows us to run six sequential injection, yeah, so six sequential injection, yeah. So um, that's... So that would be on face value an, an odd choice given the level that this car is at. Is it a case of the ECU was an existing product in the car and the car kind of grew around that ECU? The car was never supposed to go this big. Um, we started off at, I think in its early days, around 1300 horsepower. And we were good with that. And then, yeah, from there we slowly made our way up and then we're like, hey, we're running out of fuel. So now to counter that, we're gonna run another six injectors, but they'll have to be batch fired, which the Link G4X still does. So yeah, that'll be in the future, but we're gonna to continue to stay on the plug and play path until they come out with something, you know, decent. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense if, it, yeah. uh, if it's working, then there's not a lot of incentive to, to make a dramatic change, right? Correct, yeah. One of the, the common problems with the RB26 in stock form is the, the factory triggering and by that I mean the input to the ECU that tells it about the engine speed and engine position that is in stock form derived from the cam angle sensor which particularly once you start modifying the valve train becomes se severely problematic. What's been your solution there? So we're using a Ross 36 minus 2. Uh, trigger kit. So that's a, a crank trigger that goes straight on the nose of the crankshaft? That's correct, yeah. And um, that just gives us really good fuel serration up on high RPM as well, where these cars suffer a lot, or these engines suffer a lot from, you know, as you would know, the factory, the factory trigger system where they've only got the, the cam sensor up the top. Um, anything like belt movement or anything like that can cause, you know. Yeah, I mean, when you when you see what goes on there yeah. with the the belt whip, and particularly right. once you start running a really aggressive cam profile yeah. with valve springs that are suited to that cam profile, it gets pretty ugly, and it's not really reporting the actual engine position and RPM to the ECU. It gets really confused and basically becomes almost impossible to tune particularly if you want to tune it on the edge with some safety. Let, let's move back a little bit. We've yep. got the engine pretty well covered there. Uh, what about the drivetrain? So what's the, the transmission in this? So this has got an Albans ST6 low profile, which is a GDR bolt-in. Uh, back in the days, I'm pretty sure Albans used to do a ST6 where you'd had to modify the tunnel a little bit. However, the new Albans ST6 allows you to straight fit. So the rear diff, we're using a, it's a custom-made Hollinger by Racetech Performance Parts. Um, that's a nine inch diff in the rear and it uses a drive shaft shop axle as well, billet axle and... Is the, the stock differential in the R34 at the back just not up to the task of, of the sort of power and application? Correct, yeah, the, they just can't do it. It's The car's really heavy, the car weighs roughly around 1600 kilos without a driver in it, so it, it's just too heavy and it would shatter to pieces even if you attempted it. 
Now, obviously, the R34 or all the GTRs are four-wheel drive, and I'm guessing the the factory transfer case is still bolted to the back of that Albin's ST6 transmission. Correct. Yeah. So, still using a factory transfer case. We have modified the transfer case slightly by changing the clutches in it. What about the control strategy for that? Because you can vary the amount of torque being transmitted to, to the front. And, and I've talked to various GTR drag racers in the past and there's a variety of ways people are using that. Some quite extensively, some not at all. What, what's going on with your one? We haven't really played around with it. Uh, we only put the ETS Pro in there, as you know, um, just so we could allow us to do a really a burnout. But besides that, it's it's on its automatic setting where you just turn it on and it just does its thing and yeah, it's nothing special and it's not going through the ECU so the ECU is not controlling any pressure or any split to the front but yeah, it's just working like a factory a tester system would. With the Albans, uh, is it safe to assume that you're using a strain gauge gear lever there for clutchless shifting? Correct, yeah, so we're using a strain gauge there and um, also we're using the gear position sensor on the gearbox and that's all working closed loop through the ECU. All right, so I, I can't help noticing that currently there's not a huge amount of safety equipment in the car for something that's running 177 mile an hour on the, the drag strip. Yep. Is it just because it really is going to be a street car or is there going to be an intention to develop it further for drag racing and for the coach? It was never meant to be a drag car. Uh, the customer, Romanos, that owns this car, he wanted to build it for roll racing. So roll racing, there's besides a fire extinguisher in the car, you don't really need much. but. I think he might have the bug now and he wants to come back and go faster so we might be putting like a fire suppression system in there and a roll cage in the future if we want to chase the time but um, apart from that yeah just come off the street drove here and done an 8 and it'll drive home. It's an expensive bug when drag racing bites look it's been great to get some insight into the car thanks for your time. Anytime thanks. Thanks Andre. If you like that video make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week and if you like free stuff we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.